Canada session, and it, we've entitled it From Where We Stand, Indigenous Women's Voices and Perspectives. My name is Carrie Lynn Paul, and I am a holistic woman from New Brunswick. Um, I have worked with the Cody for, uh, or been associated with Cody for a very long time, almost 10 years, and I've worked as a faculty member for the last two and a half years. I uh, also lead the Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program, and, uh, and I'll be your moderator today. Robin, who many of you likely know, will be supporting us um, throughout the day or throughout the session and um, looking through the chat and, and noting your questions. I also want to note that this uh, session is being recorded, just so you know that that is being recorded, so you can have your camera on or off as you choose. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the Cody Institute is on uh, the on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Peace and Friendship Trees, which the Mi'kmaq and, and Wallis-Gawieg peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wallis-Gawieg title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. I know there are several uh, global part or participants in this um, session and uh, for their sake I would like to um, be able to give you some backgrounds about uh, some of the realities that Indigenous women are facing in Canada. I think it'll give good uh, context for, for the discussions that are to come. Um, some of these statistics are very sobering, um, but reflect the realities for Indigenous women in Canada. And um, we will, the, the speakers will then share their stories and experiences that speak to these realities, as well as strategies and recommenda recommendations for change. There was a national inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, the final report came out in June 2019. In the report, it was found that Canada was guilty of historic and ongoing genocide against Indigenous women and girls. Canada's colonial structures led directly to their current rates of violence, death, and suicide. Indigenous women are being denied, to this day, their human rights to be protected from violence and death. Indigenous girls have the highest rate of death at six times the national average of, of Canadians. Our in, infant mortality rate is three times the national average. Nationally, 47% of Indigenous children live in poverty, but in Manitoba, it is 76% and is on the increase. Poverty of Indigenous children is ultimately tied to the poverty of their mothers. The majority who are a majority of who are single mothers and we'll hear from some of them today 42 percent of our federal prison population are indigenous women 60 percent of our youth correctional centers are indigenous girls in manitoba those numbers are a lot higher in in manitoba and saskatchewan so manitoba it's 85 percent saskatchewan is 98 percent um, 91% 90, of those Indigenous women and girls who are incarcerated have suffered physical or sexual abuse before entering those uh, prisons or correctional facilities. I also want to talk a little bit about the about implications of COVID. Um, you know, Indigenous women and girls are already vulnerable and uh, they're even more vulnerable now during COVID to be infected or die at even higher rates than other Canadians. They are uh, certainly at a greater risk of domestic violence. Uh, Indigenous women are also overrepresented in the homeless population and the prison population. And these groups are especially at risk um, of contracting COVID. So these are some of the realities that we all live with. And, uh, uh, and I will introduce our first speaker um, to tell us a bit about her work. So our first speaker will be Carla Stevens. She's a member of Buck and Gag 
Mi'kmaq Nation near Antigonish, Nova Scotia. She's the proud mother of three girls and she currently works with the Antigonish uh, Women's Center on a project called Circles of Support and Change Project, transferring successful rural indigenous practices to other rural contexts. It is a project um, working in partnership with three district rural and underserved communities to develop community-led, community-based responses for preventing and responding to gender-based and sexual violence. Carla was also the community facilitator for the 2016 Responding to and Preventing Sexual Violence Buck and Gag project aimed at addressing sexual violence against Indigenous women. Carla is also an active and passionate community volunteer. She's recently headed the Need Up program, which means Mi'kmaq, in Mi'kmaq means friendship, a project focused on inclusion, friendship, and passing on Indigenous knowledge uh, in her community. It was, in a, it was a collaboration between uh, Buck and Gag Community Health Center and a Ganesh Recreation Department, and it was financially supported by, the, by Peace by Chocolate which is a Andy Ganesh based chocolate company. They raised uh, $10,000 in donation by creating with, in co-creating with Buck and Gag a Need Up chocolate bar and giving $1 from every bar sold to the project. Carla is also a 2015 graduate of the Indigenous Women Community Leadership Program at the Cody Institute. She will now speak about her current work, the Circles of Support and Change Project, she will share how the project was developed, how it's moving forward during a pandemic on a virtual platform, and how to keep community engaged. I welcome Carla. Carla, we can't hear you. <laughs> Oh, I just there said we're weathering the storm on this end. <laughs> okay. Um, yep, I just want to say uh, thank you. And if the internet is a little bit spotty, it's just because we're, we are weathering the storm here. And I am in the basement, so I just currently moved location. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Carla Stevens, as uh, Carrie Lynn had mentioned. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, and to the amazing group of women that we have here today to kind of share and discuss and converse around each other's, you know, works and things that we're doing together in our community. Um, so this topic on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is quite um, meaningful to me. Um, I do have an aunt who has been missing uh, since April 23rd, 1993 from Bangor, Maine. Her name is Virginia Sue Picto. Uh, she has been, um, she is my grandfather's daughter. Uh, we're really unsure of the situation as of right now. So we're almost hitting 26 years of her being missing. So this is kind of what had led me um, into this type of work and uh, into this field actually that I'm in right now. Um, I do have three daughters, um, which obviously is the driving force behind a lot of the work that I do for my community. And uh, as a survivor um, in our community and the work that I've done for the past six years, I felt that it wasn't um, complete. It felt that I needed to pursue it in different um, capacities and different areas within um, our districts, obviously. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little bit more of a background on the Circles of Support and Change Project, which is a project for the next five years with the Antigonish Women's Resource Center, Sexual Assault Services Association. Um, the project itself um, was developed um, through the first project that we had done here in Buckingham in 2014 to 16. So this was the respondent to and the prevention of sexual violence. So through this project, we had developed a toolkit, which was um, the idea of the toolkit was to allow community members to implement um, all the findings that we had done or we had found here in Buckingham to be successful and to be very useful towards our community's wellness and towards our community's healing and moving forward from sexual violence and gender-based violence. So a lot of the work in the toolkit is how we had developed a new project for the Circles of Support and Change. Um, the project now currently is 
um, serve in rural communities in Guysborough County, Canso, and at the Nova Scotia Community College in Port Hawkesbury. So the idea of the project is to take the uh, findings and things that were implemented here in Buckingham and to implement them and see how they work in a different setting where we had it culturally specific, a lot of the programming to um, to feel more connected to our, our own culture. So taking this out into the African Nova Scotian communities to a predominant white community like Canso, to a very diverse community like the Nova Scotia Community College, we have seen our, um, our share of challenges where we are just trying to move forward with um, policies and procedures that are in place and how we're supposed to navigate through that to have services and supports for community members, which during the pandemic now has been <laughs> an extra set of um, hurdles that we have to be going over. Uh, we do have four community facilitators right now. So there's one in Canso, there's two for the African Nova Scotian community, and there's one for the Nova Scotian uh, Community College. So the idea of the community facilitators is to kind of facilitate all the um, activities and events that they feel um, kind of coincide with what the community is looking for at that time. Um, in our first year, which has been pretty rocky for a start, um, where everybody was hired on at different times, we had community facilitators coming in. Um, we have two for the African Nova Scotian community, so they can kind of split up the work where it is three um, areas that we're trying to cover, which is quite quite a bit of work um, as of right now. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work that we're doing right now is going to be uh, virtually, obviously, having a virtual platform for um, teaching consent. I think this is our newest one, is where we're going to be um, teaching parents consent first. So a little bit of the information that we're going to be sharing with the youth, we're going to share with the parents first, just to see that if they, you know, they agree with all the content and material that we'll be sharing with their children. And the idea is to have the grade 11 and 12 uh, be trained in consent training and where they can um, actually youth train in other youth on consent. So this is the idea of the model that we're actually developing right now is what it would look like for youth to actually um, facilitate to other youth and what it would look like coming from someone from their own perspective, their own view, their own um, age group. Um, hearing it from an adult could sometimes be a bit tricky on our end when we're dealing with sexual violence and gender-based violence and how we word things and how things come out. So just building those trust and relationships that youth already have, we kind of connected and, you know, tapped into that resource where they could help us build these more healthier relationships, these boundaries, and have more kids learning about what consent actually is. So this is a kind of a, a brief overview of uh, what the project is looking like as of in the second year. Um, right now we're learning more about um, the community assets, the community strengths. So identifying what the community strengths are right now, um, just trying to identify the services and supports that are in the area right now and how we could utilize them through our project or how we can connect and collaborate with other um, organizations in the area like the Naomi Society, which is really a big part. The Nova Scotia um, Health helps a lot. Uh, Department with Health helps a lot with the organization and how we are going to move forward with this project. So allowing them to kind of help and co-develop co what this is going to look like for the next five years, because this is a community-led and a community-based project where we're not allowed in community right now, it makes it kind of difficult for us to kind of move forward with things that we need to kind of provide support and services for the people in the rural areas, which is a really big um, disconnection and gap is the internet service. Uh, we're trying to reach out to people in rural areas and they don't even have internet service. So I don't understand how a virtual platform will work for a lot of people. Um, so that's another actual hurdle and like thing we have to navigate right now is like how could we get connected and stay connected with community members who are so far away, they don't have access to internet, you know, they're dealing with 
so many other issues right now where internet isn't a top priority. So, you know, they're looking for food and, you know, shelter right now and heat and, you know, there's so many other factors that we have to put into play before we can actually move forward, you know, where this project would be meaningful and, you know, for the next five years be sustainable. Um, so right now, um, as of the five years, we are trying to um, work on our professional development, you know, ways that we could better um, serve community members. So as far as the community facilitators, each month they're taking different types of training opportunities that come online. Uh, Break the Silence is one of them. You know, there's training opportunities all the time online. So it's really great for them to kind of, um, you know, build an inventory of all these supports and, you know, different venues that they'd be able to use when they are in community. Uh, right now, we're currently working on our, um, I'm creating a blog, a website, uh, we have profiles, we're just trying to get all our information in one area, so we're able to kind of connect a little bit better with um, community members and see how the, the project is actually evolving, how they can stay connected and what's happening next with the project. Um, I think that's quite a bit of a share. Uh, if anybody has any questions, <laughs> please feel free to jump in. Hi, Carla, it's Martina. Hi. I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to, uh, to say that I would love to, to connect with you and learn more about the, the Sexual Assault Association and, and mm -hmm. how that came about. Um, I remember when I first heard about it when we were visiting your community and how struck I was when I heard that because I've never heard that before. And um, I would love to talk more about that uh, after. Thank you. Yes, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Carla. Yes, it is an amazing tool. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we would definitely have time for questions um, near the end of the presentations. Um, Lorelai, do you, would you like to go next or would you like me to introduce Martina? If you could introduce Martina, that would be great. Thanks. <laughs> so Martina Saunders is our next speaker. Uh, she is a proud Inu Eskweu from York Factory First Nation in York Landing, Manitoba in Treaty 5 territory. She is honored to be both a mother and a grandmother. Martina is an advocate for Indigenous women and has had a diverse career, including roles as senior negotiator for York Factory Future Development. Um, she also did some work with the Manitoba Kuwaitinoe Okamakanak. I'm sure she'll correct me and is also, is also a former vice president of the Kiask Hydropower Limited Partnership. In 2008, she filed a complaint with the Manitoba Human Rights Commission after resigning from the board of directors overseeing the construction of the Kiask generating station because of the power imbalances, which impacted the Cree's meaningful participation. Racism, discrimination, and sexual abuses at Manitoba Hydro work sites have been ongoing since the 1960s. Martina is also a 2019 graduate of the Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program at Cody. She will speak now on Indigenous women, gender-based violence, and resource development. Welcome, Martina. Hello. Um, my, my, my spirit name is Northern Lights Woman, and I'm from the Thunderbird and Otter Clan. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to uh, be a part of this panel today and to share um, other women's voices and experiences around um, gender-based violence and resource development. Um, as Carrie mentioned earlier that the 
the final report for um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls was released um, last summer, June of 2019. Um, we, uh, the advocacy work that women and uh, leadership have done around um, the sexual violence in the hydro man camps in northern Manitoba were heard and um, it those those calls for um, justice were they captured um, the advocacy work and the, the awareness that we were raising around um, sexual violence in the north and hydro development so um, it, it was good to see that um, those it was added to those calls of justice because um, it seems it seems like um, there isn't a lot of awareness with the connection around resource development and violence against indigenous women and the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, there is a, a like a historical and ongoing relationship with hydro development in in northern Manitoba around sexual violence. Um, a report came out from um, the Kias project. It's the Kias um, cumulative effects assessment, and in that report were stories um, from a First Nation in northern Manitoba where they were sexually assaulted by uh, hydro workers. And even RCMP were even a part of that. And um, like we've, we've heard these stories before, we know our own experiences as indigenous women, but unfortunately it takes something like that report to, to shine a light on this issue and say that we, we have a problem here. It's very unfortunate that it works that way. And that's what happened in 2018, where this report was um, confirmed by a conservative, conservative government saying that something needed to be done. So, so they said that they were gonna do an investigation into those, um, those stories that were in that report. And then, um, at that time, I had just filed uh, a, a complaint against Manitoba Hydro for the um, the racism and discrimination and the bullying that I experienced being on an executive um, board for that particular project. So it's at different levels. Not only are we impacted on the ground in our communities, from those man camps being in our traditional territory, but we're we're impacted at all different levels, um, the executive level. Um, so, what what happened with um, there was there was more cases of um, sexual violence happening in the chaos camp that particular summer 2018 and um we were hearing that uh the women weren't getting any there was no action no justice to to what was happening to them and it had to do with how the structure of um this project because manitoba hydro wasn't being held accountable for their employees. So we began to take action and um, raise awareness around this issue. Um, I traveled to Ottawa with um, our leadership to speak um, in support of Bill C-69. Um, we, we, our chief and our advisor spoke in front of uh, the Standing Senate Committee on Ener Energy, Environment and Natural Resources in support of Bill C-69 because this would have gave us uh, a gender-based analysis around resource development. And, and that's what we wanna see because as it stands now, the Environmental Act does not assess impacts on humans. 
um, it affects how um, resource development impacts the environment, but it doesn't include humans. Um, but that's that's what we wanted to see. That bill was passed, and unfortunately, it wasn't something that um, I had hoped to see. Um, there was a list of projects that it would assess. Um, uh, obviously, we're we're still working to get um, get like intersectionality or gender-based analysis into um, any planning of resource development, especially in um, like in, in our traditional territories. Um, today, like today, we're experiencing um, the effects of um, the addictions that come with resource development. Um, because there's a lot of money that's in, in, in these um, projects a lot of money comes to our traditional territory and you know we know we're, we're dealing with um, a lack of resources we have uh, the residential school experience the intergenerational impacts and now we're dealing with the day schools so this trauma is uh, resurfacing and um, it's 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 um, combined with the the resource development. So when there's a lot of money, then, you know, the addictions goes up. We're, we have a lot of drug dealers in our communities. Now we have a lot of, a lot more, I should say, a lot more um, bootleggers. And um, the drugs have, um, we're seeing a lot of cocaine in our community, whereas before it was marijuana, that, that was a daily, like it was a norm. Now the norm is cocaine. And, and you can see how it's um, affecting our people. Our people are, are lost and they're struggling with addiction. And um, I'll give you a snapshot of what's happening today. Okay, today there, there's, we're, we're, we have a new chief and council so they're dealing with um, things that they need to deal with, that the people want them to deal with. And one of them is the drugs and alcohol in our community. So because people are so lost and um, suffering from those effects, you know, they, when, you're, when you're suffering from those effects, you fly off the handle easily. And we know that our men don't have... Um, the skills to express themselves or to communicate. So when the chief and council are dealing with um, the drug dealers, um, there's been a been a backlash for indigenous women in leadership positions in our community. So that backlash is falling on us in leadership positions. So that's part of the, the, the gender-based violence that we're experiencing from the hydro development in, in our community. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, how we're dealing with it is um, just a week ago, um, women decided to take things into their, take matters into their own hands and not wait for some someone to come in and uh, help us with this. We decided to step into our roles, like as matriarchs, our traditional roles, and take action and say, that's it, we're not gonna put up with this anymore. This is gonna stop today. And uh, we, we needed our leadership to stand behind us, our men, other women in the community, the two-spirit, community, the youth, and the elders. Um, we did a community smudge because it's never been done before in our community. We're reclaiming our ways, our traditional ways. We're revitalizing our culture. We walked with our medicines to the four directions and we've prayed, we've laid medicine down so our community can start healing and, and a path be cleared for that to happen. We've had ceremonies and we've had external resources come in to help us. Like we, we invited a, a drum group as an example. 
we invited a drum group to come and be with us. We lit the sacred fire and we had ceremonies and we walked in the four directions and that was a four day process. And um, during that time we've had um, like naming ceremonies, traditional teachings, we've had sweat lodge ceremonies, women sweat, women sweat. So we're learning what, what those exactly mean. And we've learned in this process why we need those ceremonies. Because when you're walking through through the like when you're walking through the, the community and you're doing this sacred walk, you know, you're unearth you unearth things or you're coming up against an energy that's not good. So we've learned that we this is how we need to take care of ourselves, especially as women standing up. We need a women's sweat. We need to empower ourselves in that sweat. We need to feel safe in that sweat lodge. And we, need, we have to have that space where we don't have to think twice about what it is we're saying, you know, and, and we've, um, we've done that, we've experienced that. And um, another example is um, being in the teepee with the pipe ceremony. We've had a pipe ceremony every day and we have women who grew up in the residential school and who've never practiced the culture, have that opportunity to hold the pipe, to touch the pipe and to be, to be taught that this is how we pray. And, and it was okay to not know. And it was okay to ask, how do I do this, you know, and to feel safe in that environment, in that teepee. So that was a really, um, it was very astounding for me to see that, to see the women ask questions about the pipe and, and um, for elders to do their healing work and for the like the flags in ceremony to actually be hung in front of the community because it, this has never been done before. We've, we've always had to have our ceremonies kind of like on the perimeter of the community because people from um, that grew up in the residential schools are afraid of our culture. But we said, we can't wait anymore. We've waited long enough. You know, our people are dying. You know, our people are suffering. So we didn't ask permission to practice our ceremony in, in the community. We went ahead and did it. And it was such a huge response. And those are part of the things that, that we've seen because of it. Like because of the not waiting or being, being held back from that fear, you know, fearing that backlash. Well, it turned out our women are, are coming for their healing. The children are coming for their spirit names. They're waiting at the sweat lodge ceremony for four hours before it even starts. And they have been waiting for us for a long time. And we've finally made that connection and we're going to continue. You know, it's a new day in our community and our neighboring communities are watching because it was on social media. And, and that's what they want too. And, and we encourage that. Uh, so those are some of the like community actions that we're taking. And um, I'm, I'm working with um, like the University of Manitoba. They, they, wanna, they wanna connect with women in, in these outlying communities that have been um, seeing and experiencing the sexual violence, the racism, the discrimination, the bullying. They, they want that to be known and they want it to be part of um, studies so we can you know, begin to reconcile with um, the resource sector in, in our traditional territory because it, it hasn't, it's not being done and, and it needs to be. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I, I can take, take a couple of questions before I end or comments.
I, I have a comment. It's Carrie Lynn. Um, I just wanted to say, Martina, I, I want to acknowledge you too, that you ran for uh, your government, your First Nation government um, this past go around. And I know that was, um, you know, uh, a big step for you. And, and regardless of, of the outcome, um, I, I just want to honor your, your um, strength to go and do that. And, and for your, I mean, all the women, you know, stepping up and taking action for the changes they want to see in their community. That's very inspiring. I got goosebumps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll, I'll just um, add, add before I end off to your, um, your acknowledgement, Carrie, thank you so much. Um, and that like I ran for chief in my community and I didn't get in. Um, the same chief got in again and um, it was a process for me. You know, I, I had to go through that grieving process of um, losing that election, but um, because of the love for my community and my people, I didn't think twice about working with, with the chief and, and the council and we worked together. And um, one of the things that I seen and witnessed within those four days was how coming together really uplifted the leadership. And I seen that this is, this is how a community is really supposed to be. We're supposed to be balanced. And I seen that balance because we're helping our leadership. Like we're not throwing everything to them and expecting them to solve it because it, that's not how we work traditionally. So we're restoring that balance. And um, I have to say that taking this um, Indigenous women in community leadership really helped me to step into that role and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. I will uh, ask you to hold your questions off and I'll, I'd like to invite Faye um, to turn your camera on if that's okay. Faye is a ex woman of the Coast Salish Nation and is passionately committed to issues affecting Indigenous women. She's a devoted educator and activist. She has taught for many years at Lang College and the University of British Columbia, as well as several other post-secondary institutions. Her focus is Indigenous and Women's Studies. She's also been called on as an expert witness at the National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Faye is a residential school survivor and has organized and run several reconciliation circles. She currently volunteers for her home community in a variety of areas, including language revitalization, community safety, development of custom election codes, the sobriety movement, um, and many others. Faye is a longtime mentor with the Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program at Cody. And lastly, she is the founding member and lead matriarch of the Aboriginal Women's Action Network and is, na is active uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, she will speak on the Aboriginal Women's Action Network's current project called Refugees in Their Own Homelands. Thank and you, like Carrie Lynn. Um, I'm having technical difficulties, unfortunately. Um, my laptop's not working, and so I don't know how to do my camera. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's I'll okay. Proceed. I'll proceed anyway with um, what I have here. So I wanted to say that I've been involved in this area of uh, male violence against Indigenous women for decades. And I am an elder now, a junior elder. And I started in around 1982, I'm guessing, where I started to understand what was happening. Um, in 1982, I participated in the occupation of the Department of Indian Affairs as a regional office here in Vancouver. And the occupation was the result of the death of five children 
in uh, one of the communities here in BC and we occupied for eight days to bring attention to um, what was happening in our communities. And then in the early 90s, I wrote the report for the Indian Homemakers Association on um, male violence against women. I wrote that for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And today, um, the Aboriginal Women's Action Network got um, a grant from Women and Gender Equality. It's the commemoration grant, and we chose the second part of the um, that funding stream, which is to educate on violence against Indigenous women. And what we've done is organized um, several gatherings. And unfortunately, the uh, COVID-19 has really brought us to a grounding, grinding halt. And we were able to hold the first one. And we're still trying to navigate our way through to having the remaining gatherings. But I'll tell you about that anyway. Um, our gatherings were intended to bring out the voices that we didn't think were adequately being heard from during the national inquiry. And from the outset, we were trying to raise awareness on women's issues in the national inquiry. It seems kind of ironic that we're trying to bring attention to women's issues in the National Inquiry on Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. We were having difficulty with the amount of space that was being taken up by the chiefs. And um, there were women chiefs that were saying that um, many of the perpetrators of that violence are sitting around the table among the chiefs. And so we called for a meeting with Chief Commissioner Marion Buller. And at that meeting, I Googled um, sexual assaults by chiefs in their own communities, and eight cases came up right away. Eight current and um, recently past cases. So it indicates what an ongoing problem there is for Indigenous women within our own communities. So that was one issue that we felt was a glaring problem was the amount of space that was being taken up by chiefs. And the other issue was um, that there was a huge focus on families and we really did not intend disrespect for families because I know how hard they have worked. It was interpreted as disrespect often that we were bringing attention to those that were not attached to families. And I happened to be one of those at a point in my life when I was about 13 years old, I fled violence in my own family. And um, my mother fled violence at the age of 23 with four children. And when I worked in the downtown east side, I encountered so many women that were there in the downtown east side because of fleeing violence. And the family unit is what held us together uh, pre-contact. Unfortunately, the family unit became uh, reconfigured or reinvented by the colonization process and the Indian Act that instituted a patriarchal model. And we didn't live by patriarchal models prior to contact. And so that became um, the source or the site of violence for many indigenous women. Uh, being in the family unit. So we were working to address that. Um, another element that we raised, we did hold a gathering actually. We organized uh, two gatherings before the inquiry actually began. And the third issue that we addressed at our gathering was the issue of healing. 
And we were really concerned about Western models of healing and we knew that that would be a big thing coming out of the inquiry was that people would be calling for healing and there is no doubt that we require healing. And I have done a lot of that in my lifetime as well. And I have um, 38 years of sobriety. So addictions was one of the issues that I had to heal from. Residential school is an ongoing one and male violence, of course, is always ongoing. Um, I raised my own two children, but I was always under threat from the Ministry of Children and Families. They were constantly surveilling me and um, I worried that they were going to take my children. So that's another source of colonial damage that I'm continually healing from. Um, what we really wanted to see was healing that was more from an indigenous perspective, that um, we live collectively and communally, that we really need to have healing that doesn't focus on individuals, that isn't um, victim blaming, you know, for being bad mothers or alcoholics or. Um, you know, unable to handle our own finances or what have you. Those are issues related to poverty, to colonial violence, to male violence. And so what we wanted to see healing look like was a much more um, holistic approach and especially a societal or a political analysis and placing some of the responsibility there so that um, women who have either you know been incarcerated or have had their children apprehended aren't carrying the burden of what has happened to them but um that they develop an understanding beyond healing that they develop an understanding that they have survived various forms of oppression so those were the three main things that we focused on um, in at the outset of the inquiry and i'll just recap one was the involvement of men in the process and their involvement was also um wanting to be a part of the inquiry that there were a lot of murdered and missing men um and that sort of thing and the second was uh family focused and the third is um the healing models and so what we did in the project was to organize um, five groups and we've held our first one and the first one was um, having a focus group with uh, survivors of prostitution and that was a five-day process and um, at this moment, I pay homage to my dear sister, um, Sophie. Um, Sophie just passed away um, about three weeks ago, and she was the one that um, really brought us in the, the, excuse me, I'm feeling really emotional here. She, she brought our focus to um, artistic direction she was an actress and she felt that the best way to educate was through the arts and so that's what our proposal reflects and we had um two artists working with us as we worked with this uh, group of survivors and our survivors included um two elders that were um well into their 70s and they talked about coming out of a residential school and ending up in prostitution and they had an awful lot of insights on uh, what the issues were and so i'll just go over some of those before i go into um, our hopes for the other gatherings that are to come and so one of the things that really stood out for us was the stigma and shame. And these women felt that um, they had been hiding this for an awful long time. And it goes to the question that I raised earlier about um, 
healing and looking at societal responsibility or colonial responsibility for how their lives have unfolded. Um, we don't believe that they should be carrying the stigma and shame of what happened to them. And so that was one thing that came out that needs to be reflected in all kinds of programs such as um, the sobriety movement. Uh, little did I know that um, they were going into meetings and encountering Johns that, or even pimps that had um, prostituted them in the past, and there was still a um, a stigma that followed them that they were looked down upon. Um, the other thing that came out, and we were working with another women's group called the um, Asian Women for Equality, and that issue was the expungement of criminal records. And when we have had laws repealed in the past, there has been expungement of previous criminal record associated with the law that's been um, repealed. So for instance, um, the new cannabis law that has um, just been passed in within living memory. And the crimes or any offenses associated with um, the use or the selling, the possession of marijuana, those laws, those uh, criminal records have been expunged. And before that, there was a repeal of the law around homosexuality. And that law, the, the uh, crimes that were uh, perpetrated under that law were expunged. So there's two examples of expungement of records in this country. And yet when the um, Bill C-36, the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, when that law came in, there was no expungement of records. and when the Harper government came into being, there was a huge increase in the cost of um, accessing your criminal records. I think uh, prior to Harper, it was something like uh, under $50. And today it's, uh, I think it's something like $632 to access your criminal records. And at the same time, there's other costs associated with that, such as um, getting your, your fingerprint to access those criminal records. And so when you um, go in to request that, they require you to uh, provide an electronic fingerprint and that costs. And they will not accept um, anything that's on record already that's not uh, digital. So if you gave a fingerprint, say 10 years ago, that won't count because it's, um, it now needs to be uh, digitally done or electronically done. So you have to pay for that. And then you have to pay for each um, police jurisdiction and court jurisdiction where you may have a criminal offense. And so it's a really steep hill to climb to get your criminal record expunged. And with a criminal record, um, women aren't able to leave the country for one thing. They can't go into the States. They can't find any employment. Um, and in some provinces, they can't access housing because there is um, a criminal record check to get into social housing. And so there's huge barriers for Indigenous women to, um, to carry criminal records. Um, the other, how am I doing time-wise, uh, Carrie Lynn? You have about three minutes left. Okay, I better quit this. <laughs> I'm, I've only done the first gathering. Um, I'll go really quickly into some of the other things that came out. So. Um, the harm reduction, we were really concerned about the holding pattern that keeps Indigenous women stuck in, whether it's prostitution or 
drug use. And I think the, um, the new crisis around fentanyl is um, bringing, that, bringing that out into the open. Um, and then exiting programs, there just aren't enough or aren't any exiting programs besides the Christian ones. And um, I just want to bring to everyone's attention that the government is going to do an evaluation, a review of Bill C-36, the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. And we hope that people will write to their MPs and um, underscore the importance of upholding that law, that we don't want that law repealed because we feel that it'll throw Indigenous women under the bus as far as um, relegating us into prostitution and keeping us there. Um, just really quickly, I wanted to say that the next gathering that we want to do is in Montreal. And the reason why we came up to that was because um, seven Inuit women that were homeless um, died on the streets and no one really paid any attention. And it very much brought to mind what happened during the Picton massacre here in the Lower Mainland. And so we wanted to bring attention to the Inuit women in Montreal that are in prostitution and we shall be doing that um, soon, we hope. We also want to um, hold a focus group with um, incarcerated Indigenous women to um, bring their voices because they were not heard during the national inquiry. And um, another group that we really wanted to do but we won't be able to do is um, an issue that was read, raised by Madeline Redfern. She's the mayor of Ikaluit. And she was saying during the national inquiry that um, whenever indigenous women travel with indigenous male leadership, they always seem to encounter either sexual harassment or sexual assault. And she really got a lot of pushback on that and we wanted to support her. So we are planning on doing something around that. And, um, I wish I had said more about artistic expression. I am definitely not an artist, but I can't speak enough about how powerful the arts are in bringing our message through. And we really hope that some of these projects will um, become more than just part of our project, that they can become a part of artistic expression in this country. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Carrie Lynn. Thank you so much, Faye. Um, I, I did my best to transcribe this, but <laughs> uh, with some difficulty. Um, I will ask you to hold your questions um, until the end, and I'd like to invite Lorelai to um, come onto the screen. Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm just going to do your introduction. Oh, I'll find my notes, okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Lorelai Williams is an interior Salish Coast Salish woman from Skatine Nations. Sticks Al's the Alice. Yeah, that <laughs> Vancouver, BC, and is a single mom raising two beautiful and amazing children. Lorelai is, is a strong advocate for victims and families of MMIWG. In 2012, she founded Butterflies in Spirit, a dance group comprised of family members of MMIWG with the goal of empowering Indigenous women and raising awareness about her aunt Belinda Williams, missing since 1978, and cousin Tanya Holick, who was murdered in 1996. Lorelai is currently the program manager with the Restoring Circles Project, an Indigenous ally transformative justice project and a research assistant at Sovereign Bodies Institute, where she's developing a project aimed at producing an understanding and awareness of how dance can be utilized as healing practice for both indigenous survivors of violence and their families. She's also an active member of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Coalition, 
And Lorelai is also a 2018 graduate of the Indigenous Women Community Leadership Program at Cody. And her wish is that violence would end for women and girls around the world. Lorelai will speak on the intersectionality of colonization, residential schooling, and missing and murdered Indigenous women. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people for the territory that I'm on right now. And I would like to say to everybody to educate yourselves on the territories, the lands that you're on, uh, especially across Canada. You know, not a, lot of, not a lot of people know this, but our, our lands here are owned by our are people, well, they were before colonization. Sorry, I get emotional. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, I, I was dealing, I am dealing with a family emergency. So I, I just wanna put that out there right now. My name is Lorelai Williams. I am from Shkati Nations on my mom's side, Stailis on my dad's side and as you can see I am not speaking my indigenous language I'm speaking English my indigenous language was taken from my mom when she went to residential school you know Tamara Star Blanket who wrote the book Suffer the Little Children which I have right here says it so well you know there's a lot of People who say, you know, the children were abused, you know, that word is used a lot, but they were raped, you know, they were beaten, you know, there was death by disease, they were tortured, they were in forced, there was forced starvation, forced labor, sexual predation. And my mom this is what happened to my mom in residential school. My last name is Williams. And I just learned last week in my intro to law class with Sharon McIver, who's this amazing indigenous women's rights activist, who is someone who challenged the government in Canada in a landmark case regarding sex-based discrimination among indigenous women and children. Last week, she taught me that the reason why my last name is Williams is because the colonizers who came in, they started, we couldn't say our indigenous names. So they just started giving whatever names they could to our people, uh, normally first names. So that's why I'm Williams and that's why there's so many Williams across this country. I grew up in Vancouver here in BC, which is the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Nation. I grew up here because my mom thought it would be better for me because there was so much bad things happening on the reserves where my family is. And my family, a lot of my family lives in Mission where, which is close to the residential school that my family went to. Even though my mom tried to protect me from all the stuff that's happening there, like sexual abuse, alcoholism, it still happened here. You know, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My mom tried to numb the pain from what happened to her in residential school. I was sexually abused myself. When I think about my very first memory, when I go back, my very first memory is actually when I was four years old, sitting at a bus, uh, hiding in a laundromat because my mom was fleeing abuse. We were waiting for the Greyhound bus to come to Vancouver. This is my very first memory as a child. You know, when I talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women, I was born into this. 
My auntie Belinda Williams went missing in 1978, which was two years before I was born. Then I was the next girl born and I look like her. You know, I grew up around my family missing her. I grew up hearing stories about her and whenever they talked about her, their voices would shake. And I knew that I looked like her, but when I started becoming more public about the stuff that has happened to my family, it was weird for me to hear people from the media, people from the community, people that I didn't even know, the police, the RCMP to actually say, you look like your missing aunt. And this first started when I attended the Wally Opal inquiry. I forgot to mention why I do the work that I do. You know, I think Carrie Lynn touched on it a bit, but you know, my aunt has been missing since 1978. My cousin, Tanya Holick was murdered by serial killer, Robert Picton. My other cousin was taken by a different serial killer, Terry Arnold, when she was 16 years old and she was raped by him in the mountains. Thankfully, she got away. She's still alive today. My other aunt was pushed out of a window in the downtown east side. Thankfully, she survived. Canada is not perfect. And I can't stress that enough. You know, I've done a lot of speeches across this country, down in the States, down in Central America, South America. And it's down there where they think that Canada's perfect. They don't, some people actually don't know that we exist up here. They think it's just white people in Canada. You know, with the residential school system, not a lot of people around the world know about this. And you'll, you'll learn more in Tamara's book about this. She proves the genocide against our people. You know, when my mom passed away, I was at, I was attending the Wally Opal inquiry. When she passed away, I was so angry with the government. I actually blamed the government. I actually talked to a lawyer and I wanted to sue the government for killing my mom because my mom died from alcoholism because she was numbing that pain of what happened to her in residential school. When we buried my mom, we, we left a little hole for her because she was so scared of the dark. Because in the residential school, when the lights went out, that's when the bad things happened. Right now at her grave, she has those little solar panel things. We ha my, my uncle put some solar panel things so light could still get to her. You know, growing up as a kid, we always knew to never turn the lights out when she was sleeping, Where, whatever room she was sleeping in. She mostly slept on the couch because she was so traumatized to sleep in a bed. She even had a couch in her room at one point because it was hard for her to sleep on a bed. You know, I say this a lot, you know, Canada is racist. The systems are against us. And this is why our women go missing and are murdered at a high rate in our country. You know, with the police, the government, the media, and predators know this, and that's why they target us here. And, you know, historically, they were targeting us because they were after our lands. You know, what better way to get our lands than to target our Indigenous women and girls, our life givers, right? In BC, we have a highway called the Highway of Tears. You know, how do we have that? A highway of tears, which is known for our missing and murdered women. You know, and I, I have one point in my own life where I was stuck on a highway and I was forced to walk down a dark highway. And I actually called the police before I even had to go down this highway, but I had no other choice. I was only 16 years old. And 
I ended up getting picked up by two guys. And the first question they asked me was, were you drinking? You know, and I was like, no, I was so desperate. I got in with those guys to get home. You know, there's a lot of talk that, you know, it's our own indigenous men doing this, but you know, it was the RCMP that came out with that, I think. Um, it's just kind of trying to take away from what's actually really happening. There are so many white men out there who target our indigenous women and girls and they get away with it. You know, we have those indigenous women and, who came forward about the police uh, sexually abusing them, beating them in Quebec and nothing happened to those police officers when they were brought to court. You know, we have Tina Fontaine, the young girl, where there was a lot of evidence to show that this white guy killed her. He, he got away with it. He's free. You know, this happens a lot to our people. There's actually indigenous people out there who will use white people to do their crimes because they know that they'll get away with it. Right? Our relationship with the police is so bad. You know, they were the ones who took the children from our people and threw them in the residential schools, which were run by the churches. And in my missing aunt's case, she was actually technically not listed as missing until 2004. She went missing in 1978. And even though my aunt, even though my family tried so many times to report her missing, they never took her case seriously. Even when my cousin went missing in 1996, when this whole thing was happening with Robert Pickton, my family came forward again to try to report my missing aunt missing, but because my Auntie Belinda wasn't deemed a sex worker or a drug addict, they wouldn't take her case at that time. And Tanya's case, when my aunt tried to report her missing, she was faced with a racist and judgmental VPD civilian clerk, Sandy Cameron, who would say things like, she's just in Mexico partying. Why, why isn't she taking care of her kid now? I should call child welfare services. And there's so much more that came out of the Wally Opo inquiry. It's there. And then she even lied on the stand and said she didn't say those things. And it wasn't just my family. She said these things about You know, I'm talking about the relationship with the police. You know, George Floyd died recently, May 25th, 2020. Ever since he died from May 25th, 2020 to July 1st, nine indigenous people were killed by police up here. Not a lot of people know that. It's actually Native Americans who were killed more down in the States than black people. Out of those nine indigenous people, Chantal Moore was killed back east. She's from BC. She's actually a relative to two of my, my butterflies, two of my friends in my dance group. You know, the, the police were doing a wellness check. Wellness checks are not good for our, indi our indigenous women and girls. When the police go to do wellness checks, they take the they might get killed, as in Chantal Moore's case. If not, they get taken, thrown into an institution where pills are thrown at them, where they get addicted to those pills. And if they have children, those children are taken and they're put into, into the child welfare system, which is a whole other obstacle itself. And I could talk so much more about that, but I, I don't have that much time to talk about that. I testified at the National Inquiry twice. Once because my friend was almost killed by her boyfriend who ended up killing himself. 
and there's a there's a whole story behind that too where i used all the resources that i have had working and have you know i was working at the vancouver aboriginal community policing center i used all my resources to help her get out but she ended up going back because she couldn't get a place to stay and i i could go on about that anyways her boyfriend stabbed her and then he killed himself. So that's why I testified in White Horse, but I also testified um, for my family, for Tanya, for my Auntie Belle. But what else came out of that, which I didn't even realize I talked about, it was just so emotional, you know, testifying that I, I talked about how the police, you know, when they go to domestic violence cases, the one thing that they say is, what do you want us to do about this? You know, they come to the calls and they say, what do you want us to do about this? And that throws people off, that throws us off, that makes us not want to go through with charging our abusers. And I actually found out later on that, from the police actually, that it's in their policies that they can't even say that to us. And it's not just me, like this is from personal experience. That's how I realized this. This is what I went through. But I also noticed a lot of women in the downtown east side were going through this and other women that I was working with as well, other indigenous women in Vancouver. And the other complaint I have against the Vancouver Police Department is there was an incident where my friend was found in an alley and they didn't take her to the hospital to get a rape kit done. That's another long story in itself that I won't get into uh, because I can't because uh, of time. But in the end, when I asked the police officer, why didn't you bring her to the hospital to get a rape kit done? He said, we have no reason to believe she was raped. You know, I was like, you found her in an alley. He said the ambulance checked her over and they have no reason to believe she was raped. Again, she was found in an alley. We asked her if she was raped and she said no. And there was a lot of reason for me to believe that she was raped and I won't get into that. But then when, by the end of that conversation, the police officer said to me, if you think that she was raped, call the police. And I was looking at him, this is the police officer, you know, and working at the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center at the time, I was like, I know your bosses. And that was the only reason why they started to do things on that case, I believe. And my other complaint is against the RCMP, which I won't get into because it has to do with my Missy Ants case. But if you want to learn more about the injustices, of our people. You know, my friend came out with this book called The Colonial Problem, an Ind Indigenous Perspective on Crime and Injustice in Canada. It's by my friend, Le Dr. Lisa Monchelin. She's the first Indigenous woman to get her PhD in criminology. And yeah, some of our laws, our Indigenous laws are in there as well. And yeah, um, Carrie Lynn mentioned my dance group a little bit, Butterflies in Spirit, which I started to raise awareness of MMIWG. I started to get my missing ass picture out there, but I also wanted to honor my cousin, Tanya Holick. You know, we've performed across Canada, down into the States. Uh, we've gone as far as Bogota, Colombia. Um, yeah, we, we were down in Mexico a few times before COVID happened. You know, and starting this dance group, I didn't realize that other family members of MMIWG would want to join my dance group and represent their missing and murdered loved ones. You know, and this is where I learned how healing dance is. I never knew that before. I was a beginner dancer. I didn't know how to dance before. You know, right now, and then she mentioned I'm on the coalition and I'm working with Sovereign Bodies Institute down in the States, California. And I'm a student now too, I'm working on my bachelor's degree, but I want to go to law school in September. I'm working on that right now. And the reason why I want to go to law school is because of what, May, what Faye mentioned earlier. You know, there's a lot of our indigenous women who are getting criminal records when they don't have to. 
but the white lawyers are pushing them through the system and telling them to bleed guilty just to push them through when they could actually fight for them. And you know, they mentioned it earlier, you know, the, when they get a criminal record, it affects them for life. You know, it affects them, you know, when it comes to getting jobs or when it comes to trying to get their children back or all of these things. And that's why I want to go to law school. And thank you for your time. I'm finished here. Thank you so much, Lorelai. Um, and I'm just going to check time here. So we are in our last 10 minutes. I would like to invite um, our last speaker, who is Geneva Dennis. She is a Mi'kmaq woman from Bodledai First Nation. Uh, uh, she's a proud mother of two small children and is in her final year of the Bachelor of Arts majoring in political science at St. Francis Xavier University. Geneva volunteers on campus um, or in her First Nation community when she is able and has worked as a summer intern and as a part-time research assistant with the Cody Institute. Geneva will speak on Indigenous women's safety both on and off campus. Geneva, I invite you to come on. Oh, we're having some sound interference. I, I can't hear you that well. You don't have to come on video if, if, um, if it helps, but hopefully we can hear your audio. I still can't hear you, Geneva. Robin, is there anything we can do to help her? Uh, um, so if she has um, earbuds or anything plugged in, she should probably unplug those and make sure she doesn't use her video. I don't know if she has them plugged in or not. Geneva, I'd still like to give you an opportunity. I think it has to do with her internet connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Geneva, the internet connection is not going to work. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, I would like to um, turn to Robin um, and maybe take some questions while uh, we try to figure out if we can get Geneva on. Robin, did you have any questions in the chat? Uh, yeah, I was also just a minute to suggest that perhaps Geneva can. Sorry, Geneva, you sound like you're at the back of a tin can. Unfortunately, um, Geneva could also post her key points or post some of her, um, what she wanted to share in the chat so that she can be captured in this moment. Oh. There's also feedback on Geneva's um, sound. It sounds like she might have more than one um, device going. If she does, then that would take up extra bandwidth. Um, unfortunately, it looks like um, Geneva yeah, I'm going to I'm going to ask that Geneva um, put her points in the note or in the chat or uh, she can enter them onto the um, ongoing conversation that we have uh, 
um, for this session. I will ask now that if anyone wants to ask a question, um, that they come off mute and ask it, or um, Robin, if you could get some questions from the chat, that would be great. Okay, yep. And that can be a question for any of the speakers. So I see a question here for Martina. Maybe others can also speak to this. What type of BENS programs are currently being implemented in your community? and Are they culturally specific? Can you repeat the question? Yes, so what type of men's programs are currently being implemented in your community and are they culturally specific? Right now, there, there isn't too much being done for uh, men's supports in the community, but it has been raised uh, recently because, um, just because of what has been happening in the community. Um, next week, um, I'm, I'm organizing a medicine camp. And um, again, we have to bring in an external resource because we don't recognize, we don't know our own medicine. So I'm bringing somebody in to um, take us out onto the land to, to pick medicines and to mix medicines, teach us how to do that. But I'm also um, going to be talking to um, one of the council members to put something together for men because I know there's men in this community who have, um, they're trying to change their lives. They've um, stopped using drugs. They've stopped um, the alcohol and uh, they wanna live a better life. So it's just um, a matter of um, the programs in the community working together and making that happen for the men because it's like, it's not rocket science, you know, it's, it's, it's um, helping people to connect and get those programs and supports into place. Thank you. I, thanks Martina. I know there are some other questions coming up, but I have overlooked announcing our keynote listener, um, who is Jacqueline O'Neill, the Canadian ambassador for women, peace and security. Um, I'll invite Jacqueline to come on um, and uh, tell us uh, what she what she heard. Thanks, Carrie Lynn. I don't want to uh, get in the way of the Q and A, so I can just paste. If everyone will forgive, like the spelling mistakes and the sloppy nature of it, I can paste some comments in the chat, uh, and then you can go back to Q and A. And for this time right now, I just want to say thanks for letting me be a part of this. I'm definitely smarter or at least better informed as a result of these 90 minutes. And I'm also really energized as well as soothed. So I'll put my comments in the chat and we can go back to the discussion. So thank you for, for heading, heading it to me for that option. I appreciate it. And thanks so much to all our speakers. I really, really appreciated everything you've said. Thank you for that. Um, Excuse me, Carrie Lynn, this is Robin. I see that Geneva has come back. Did we want to uh, see how her um, technology is working? Sure, um, I, I recognize that we only have about a minute left. Um, I'm not sure that'll be enough time, Geneva. Do you want to just come on and say a few yeah. words? Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Okay. So I'm just gonna say a couple words as being um I'm I'm Mi'kma of and I'm from Mombolitic First Nation in Nova Scotia. And uh I'm currently in my um like my last year of my um BA and Bachelor of Arts and um I, it's cool because I'm I'm planning on going into law school next September as well at Dalhousie. And that that was one of the uh that was one of the the main reasons why I wanted to was the people 
like how our people face so much injustice and that I want to be almost like that, that's that um, stepping point to, you know, being there for my people and at least the voice. If there, you know, there's not a lot of Indigenous lawyers and stuff. I don't find much. And I'd like to be, you know, one. And um, yeah, my my topic I was supposed to speak on was the uh, the safety on and off campus as Indigenous women. And, um, you know, I face a lot of, um, like I'd be scared and stuff in uh, my first year because I was a single parent and, um, you know, it was scary just being alone and off reserve, lived off, lived on reserve all my life. And, you know, I faced a lot of challenges with, you know, just like the cultural barrier of being close with my family and my culture to, you know, not knowing anyone at all. So it was, you know, it was a struggle. And, you know, even being on campus, you know, sometimes I would be scared going to night classes or, events and all that and you know I, I always say like it's good to kind of have technology on you like you know at least if you have a phone you know there's location and all that on there and you know I'd always like if I was if I felt uncomfortable and all that I'd call like a friend and you know all those kind of things are just like meeting up with a friend on campus to walk or go for you know a walk you know a walk or like to a class or like an event and all that just I don't like really being alone much like on and off campus so yeah I have two kids now and um one boy one girl and yeah it's just I that's my main goal is wanting to become an indigenous you know lawyer you know hoping to be that within the next five years and yeah that's basically me I'm sorry I had technical difficulties but um I was glad I was able to get in but um, yeah, I come from a small reserve. It, it's, it has probably like seven or 800 people like registered. That's not including who's all on the reserve. And, um, you know, it was really different moving into a town. You know, it's not even a city, but it's, it, it felt like it. And, uh, you know, it, I've faced a lot of cultural barriers, you know, and um, that's, that's kind of my, my story. I couldn't really say much, but um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Geneva. I, I uh, admire your persistence to come and present, even if it was short. Um, and I love to hear uh, young Indigenous women's voices, especially and and Mi'kmaq ones um, as we're in your territory. I want to take this time to thank everyone for attending and for Ambassador O'Neill for listening to our Indigenous women's voices. I want to encourage um, people to register for our free Indigenous approaches to asset-based community development workshops. They're starting next week on September the 29th, Tuesday. Robin will put a link in the uh, chat if you're interested in attending those. They are free. Um, we also are wrapping up our um, uh, Circle of Abundance campaign. We are, we've raised close to $1 million um, to help take Indigenous women's uh, leadership programming across the country. Um, and we hope to really connect uh, women globally as well. I know um, Martina had a chance to, to spend some time with our international Indigenous women um, uh, that came uh, during IWICL last year. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great first step, I think, in the, that local global connection. Um, and, and hopefully this, this will be an opportunity to continue that work. Um, so if you could help us get to that million dollars, we are almost there. Um, that would be wonderful. Uh, did you have, did anybody have any parting words? Robin, did you have anything to say before we go? Uh, I just wanna say thank you so much everyone for, for coming and for the speakers for sharing and being so intimate and with your with your stories and and making yourselves vulnerable, so we can hear the the power of your experiences. Also, um, there's more sessions for the local women's voices for peace conference happening tomorrow, which is the last day. So, and um, we can post the the chat from this session. We can post it into the discussion forum on the conference webpage for people's reference, and also if you want to continue some discussion there as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, bye, everybody. Thank you.